Thanks. Good afternoon and welcome to our panel. We have a very exciting conversation, so I want to dive right in on landing an ambitious global uh, plastics treaty. My name is Douglas McCauley. I'm a professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I run a group called the Benioff Ocean Science Lab there at UCSB. Um, I'm going to invite our panelists to come and join us, please, uh, on the stage as they're coming up. In fact, I'll introduce you once you, you're here with us, but I believe I could invite you to come right up. Um, I would love to bring onto the, uh, onto the screen an invitation for all of you to participate in the conversation. So we have a very engaging conversation about an opportunity that's in front of us in 11 months to negotiate a treaty which could bring an end to plastic pollution and end to plastic pollution forever. So I'm going to ask our panelists the very same thing, but I want to begin by asking you to engage by uh, asking or in, uh, answering for me what you think would be the most impactful action or policy that you'd like to see in a treaty in order to, again, get to this goal of ending plastic pollution forever. Well, as you're engaging our panelists, uh, I'd like to invite the stage Dr. Uh, Leila Benali. Um, Dr. Benali is the president of the sixth session of the UN Environment Assembly, minister, and also the Minister of the Energy Transition and Sustainable Development in Morocco. Uh, minister Javier Gonzalez Olechea Franco um, is the Minister of Foreign Affairs at the Republic, in the Republic of Peru. Welcome. I may welcome to the stage Hein Schumacher, CEO of Unilever. Uh, to the stage also, very glad to have remarks from Inger Anderson, Executive Director from the United Nations Environment Program, and Jim Fitterling, Chair and CEO of Dow. Well, thank you all. I know that you're here on the stage for the same reason that we are all here engaging in the conversation both live and virtually, which is that we're committed to solving this global problem of plastic pollution. So we have plastic pollution that's ending up in our rivers, in our fields, in our forests, and our oceans. Um, I'm going to bring forward an image here uh, that was taken on an island where I had the privilege of spending a, a, a few months of a happier portion or an exciting portion of my youth uh, in the middle of the Pacific. It's an image of an albatross chick that died after ingesting plastic pollution that was fed to it by its parents. Um, the tragedy of seeing an image like this really only kind of hits home for you if you have that special opportunity as I had to be a roommate for two million albatross mm -hmm. in a special place like that in the Pacific. Now these are animals that, again, the tragedy becomes realized when you get to learn that they live as long as humans do. <coughs> they fall in love <coughs> like we do and actually maintain relationships as long as we do, stay committed to the ones that they fall in love with. They're better dancers than I am, which perhaps is not saying very much, but nonetheless, uh, a truly majestic animal that, again, when you see a, an individual like this lost, makes the loss of that family significant. But this is not just an issue uh, for albatross, for sea turtles, for whales. It's an issue for <laughs> us as well. Plastic pollution <coughs> is a human challenge and human issue. So probably some of you, as you were inbound coming into Davos, saw re research that came out for Columbia University last week Using different methods and laser spectrometry, they estimate that 240,000 pieces of tiny, tiny plastic are found in every liter of bottled water. There's a statistic that I just could not get out of my head on the plane every time the flight attendant refilled my cup of water on the plane. <coughs> so a human health issue, it's also a climate issue, and also a climate opportunity. So Open plastic pollution, by some measures, um, has the emissions footprint of aviation and brain shipping combined. So to the conversation at hand, the treaty, we've had, um, we have, as I say, 11 months ahead of us to negotiate to the conclusion <coughs> that it could end all of the challenges, <coughs> environmental challenges, the human health challenges, um, and these issues about climate challenges in the plastic system. We have 60 countries that have come to the stage and already said, we want to zero out in this treaty, zero out plastic pollution by 2040. Now, as I said, I'm a scientist. We're a little bit of a skeptical crowd. The first thing that we did was we did science. We spent a year with our labs at UC Berkeley and UC Santa Barbara trying to understand, is that even a realistic possibility? Can we actually get to zeroing out plastic pollution? Business as usual, 
to give you a sense of the gravity of where we're headed. But happily, we're here to talk about business as unusual. Business as usual would create a pile of plastic pollution that would swamp the entire island of Manhattan and raise a pile up into the sky that would disrupt aviation and touch the clouds. Um, when we engaged this modeling exercise, what we found was we could actually get a very, very exciting result. We could get to zero. It was possible by 2040. In fact, it was possible with just five policy actions. We do a combination of different policy actions, but we can get there. The research was powered by artificial intelligence. So the artificial intelligence is saying we can solve this. Now the question, in essence, for us today is do we have the human intelligence? Do we have the political intelligence to solve this problem? And that is exactly what I have in great supply here on the panel, a great deal of human intelligence and political intelligence. So I'd like to turn over to our panelists to engage the same question about uh, how we end this problem together. Mr. Benali, if I can begin with you. So as I mentioned in your introduction, you're president of the UN Environment Assembly. They're convening the assembly in just a matter of weeks next month in February. Can you share with us a little bit more about how you see the assembly fitting into this process of coming to a just and robust equitable treaty? Well, thank you. I think we're, uh, you've highlighted very well that um, the, the INC on plastic pollution really is a, is a lifetime opportunity to uh, end uh, the, the issue of plastic pollution. As we enter this sprint to finalize uh, the negotiations on the instrument by the end of 2024, I think the role of, uh, of UNEA 6 is really to show that sense of, of urgency. So uh, strong and ambitious and bold statements, bold leadership is going to be really more essential than ever. Um, in the negotiations process, we've noticed that countries, several countries have uh, uh, made it very clear that they wish to have a bold commitment that addresses well, first, the full life cycle of plastics, uh, not only part of the value chain, um, protects the environment, but also protects human health. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll have a special uh, gift for you on that one. Um, and also, the, the, because it's a conf like a conference of parties where we have to find consensus, we have to pay atten attention to the unique circumstances of uh, every country. Uh, we want to reach, and that's the, the latest, latest draft of the ministerial declaration that we are working on, and hopefully we will have a bold draft uh, by the end of February when we uh, gather in Kenya for UNEA. Uh, the, this draft is really pursuing uh, the uh, common ground for a fair, effective, balanced, and ambitious legally binding agreement through the INC by the end of 2024. So that's the target that we set for ourselves. The impact of plastic pollution, uh, and that's the reason why I, I wanted to give some, some, some numbers there, the plastic we produce, 46% end up in landfills, but only 9% is actually recycled after losses. Um, you talked a lot about the impact on birds, fish that we end up eating. They, they have plastic particles in their stomachs, but the issue of microplastics is definitely an issue that is really under-researched. And in UNEA, we have developed this keychain, which is the quantity of microplastics and nanoplastics that 20 people inhale in one week. These are being found now in human blood and the accumulating organs. Now we can wait for science to tell us what will be the impact of inhaling. I'm not even talking about drinking, I'm just talking about inhaling here. The impact on our health of inhaling this quantity every week. That's why I wanted to insist on, in addition to tackling uh, pollution, there are a few strategic goals that were uh, that can guide, uh, we think circularity is very important there. Uh, definitely ensuring that uh, plastic products are designed to be circular at the production level. Manage the plastics that cannot be reused or recycled in an environmentally uh, responsible manner. But I really want this discussion today to take us to standards for uh, plastic recycling and all those agreed measures in product design this year, because we really have, by the end of the year, to come up with a legally binding agreement on plastic pollution. The other message that I wanted to leave with you here is that 
Indeed, ending plastic pollution is not a job of government only. We'll have to go do it together, private sector, industry, but also civil society, and academia, the youth, and the informal sector. In Morocco, in the Kingdom of Morocco, we have a large informal sector that needs to be uh, embarked in the issue of plastics recycling. A few national actions that we took at, at the level of Morocco. Um, we, as you know, we are deeply committed to environmental protection and sustainable development. We are, became very aware, aware, very early, on the impact of pollution uh, on natural ecosystems and on our health. So we took a number of legal regulatory measures. I don't want to bore you with the details. We have a law banning the manufacturing and import and export and marketing of plastic bags. We adopted an eco-tax uh, on the sale and import and production of plastic products. And we are currently, as we speak, revising the law on waste to introduce the principle of extended producer responsibility and the adoption of plastic-free coastal strategy and action plan. Well, thank you for that leadership, and thank you for the forthcoming leadership there in Nairobi at UNEA. I want to keep going a little bit from the theme that you opened on human health with a question for Minister gonzalez Olachea. Um, Minister, uh, there's been a great deal of new science. Leila highlighted a bit of this. There's more out there about the impacts of plastic pollution on human health, and as you said, a lot yet to be learned. How do you see the future of this plastics treaty playing a role in protecting human health? First of all, I would like to thank you, and Mr. Macaulay, for your invitation. I'm honored to participate in this panel discussion along with uh, Mrs. Anderson uh, Benali and Mr. Uh, Schumacher and Fitterling. Uh, thank you so much. What does Peru think? Well, just like any other human being which is affected by a reality that seems to be reversible, but as Brecht said, Arthur Brecht said, do not approach the disorders of nature as something usual. Do not uh, be shy on efforts to fight against this, because there's a will. If there's a will, there's a way. And in this case, uh, political will does exist, and there's a growing consensus uh, in and a growing political will among countries, uh, which. Uh, um, reflects what the largest majorities who are affected, affected think and say. My children, young people, my grandchildren, those who are here, they all want a healthy life. And of course, health is already being affected. And that has happened for many years already. Health and human bodies have been historically affected by harmful treatment uh, that foodstuff have uh, received. So this is an old story, a new reality with new challenges, and we are optimistic about this. If the agreement is binding and if it foresees monitoring the compliance of what has been agreed in the treaties, just like in any other international, in many other international treaties, to avoid these double standards uh, whereby uh, one signs a binding agreement and then when you do reviews in different countries, authorities uh, uh, do not uh, do not report on this, uh, are not accountable for what they do. So we need to have a, a faithful monitoring of uh, the compliance of the new standards, because it is young people, besides us who have responsibilities, it is young people who are mostly aware of the deep ecology, and uh, they are uh, keen on healthier lives uh, free of plastics and pollution in general. Like so many of these conversations, I appreciate that you're highlighting the importance of thinking about next generations, because that is indeed our responsibility in this decision making. Um, Hein, if I can come to you next. Uh, 
Unilever is a large global business. Any large global business has a large global footprint, which leaves you with a lot of authority, I think, to offer a vantage point here on the treaty. So from your desk at Unilever, what do you think an ambitious treaty should look like? What, what should we be prioritizing as we're in these next negotiating sessions? Sure. You know, first of all, I mean, it's, it's good that um, you know, I'm pr representing Unilever here, but importantly also the, uh, the business coalition um, you know, towards an international treaty. And like there were 60 countries, which I just, just learned, uh, you know, talking about actually there's been 170 uh, organizations from the private sector who are gathered in that, in that coalition. Unilever is chairing it or is co-chairing it, I should say, but also other companies, whether it's Nestle, Walmart and so forth, are, are in there. So I think that's, that is important. So quite a critical mass, actually. And we are very keen uh, to progress this. Um, you know, I'll, in fact, if you, if you look back over the last couple of years, many of us have signed up to pledges. Uh, they were voluntary. Uh, you know, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, obviously very important to us, wanted to make uh, progress. Uh, and the great news is <coughs> all these organizations that have signed voluntary pledges actually have made progress, but, but we are not as far as we would like to be. And it's fair to say that most of us, including us, are somewhat behind our internal ambitions on the, on the topic. So I think that's the good bridge uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to an international treaty and what that should look like. And I very much want to build on the comments that, uh, that were made earlier. Um, you know, it has to be a binding agreement. Um, that, that is super important for us. Um, you know, it, the, the goal has to be an end to the pollution um, and achieve a more circular economy uh, through, and three things are important. It's reduction, mm -hmm. it's circulation and recycling, but also prevention. And, well, I'll come back to that. We also expect the, the treaty to be, on, to be for the full uh, life cycle. You know, it cannot just be on uh, recyclability and downstream only. That is super important to us because don't forget that the costs in our system are very much borne because of differences in recyclable, recyclability systems and therefore the design of our products is a very fragmented exercise leading to unnecessary costs. We also believe, as I said, binding because national plans in themselves are good but they have proven to be insufficient. Um, I come personally, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, and we've been working on this, and it's quite unbelievable to say, but if we are working on certain packaging solutions that are fully recyclable in the Netherlands, and you know we can use the PCR for our products, actually just across the border in Germany, it's a whole different system. And that fragmentation, even within economic blocks as, as the EU, we should absolutely uh, counter. I think um, you know um, that doesn't mean, by the way, that we shouldn't allow for national flexibility. There are, of course, national circumstances that we should, uh, that we should honor. Um, I, I think those are probably the most important points I just wanted to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make now. So I think, importantly, moving from voluntary to a treaty is cru super crucial. Um, and once again, I think business is, is having a strong voice here. We are pleading for this for a while. And we're very keen for INC3 now to move on after the draft text and uh, go to INC4 in Ottawa. So I'm having great expectations. Well, thanks for sharing those perspectives and for communicating the same ambition for the coalition you're bringing together. The special thing about Davos, of course, is that we have those ingredients that you mentioned, or at least some of those, many of those here. We have business and not just one business, multiple business, a coalition of businesses behind you, policy, and other voices, youth that need to be brought in, but thank you for that voice. I do want to maybe sample some perspectives as we get closer to policy from Inger. Inger, can I, can I ask you, well, a thanks is first in order. So thank you for, for the leadership from UNEP in this process and a thanks to the team as well, all of the folks there that are bringing this forward. It absolutely is not an easy challenge, right? The when was anything that we ever try to do for the environment, for the planet, easy. So thank you for that. Um, I'd love if you could tell the folks that are here on the panel, if you could tell the folks in the audience, the folks that are watching virtually, what sort of concrete steps do you have for all of us? Similar vantage, similar question, but from your vantage point, what concrete steps do you have for us to in these next two negotiating rounds for the treaty, one in Ottawa in April, later in the year in South Korea, what concrete steps do you have that we can do to help support a successful treaty? Well, thank you, and this is really a, a great conversation. Look, um, it, 
we obviously would like to see that governments, because this is amongst governments, uh, first, uh, uh, as you know, but that they listen to the broader community uh, that, that is part of their, their remit. And that includes the NGOs, but it certainly includes business, it includes science, and so on and so forth. Um, so that we can, yes, get ambitious, right? <laughs> A, an unambitious treaty will not be accepted by the populations that vote because they have ambition in heart. Do they understand what ambition looks like? No, not exactly, but nevertheless. But what it has, has to therefore do, and when we look at all other treaties that we, UNEP, have on our belt, it has to have some timelines for certain things to happen. Um, elimination of the unnecessary, the short, shortly, uh, short used uh, kind of uh, plastics that frankly are a complete waste of a precious resource um, will, will be absolutely critical in engaging and understanding that. And businesses can lean in and are already leaning in on, okay, so how do we replace? How do we reinvent our, our product? Does it have to be enveloped in plastic? Does it have to be liquid? Can it be deliquefied? Is there another way of delivering it? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is a very interesting space that the brand owners are in and one that we really think that there's a lot that can be done here. Um, I think um, uh, for, for, um, for the recyclers, you know, help po policymakers understand the difficulties, some of the barriers that are real, right? It's not as simple as, okay, everybody gets different colored waste bins and then they do it's complicated, and getting compliance or doing it in a central <coughs> spot, the, the, those issues are, are clearly uh, at play. But then I think also very much, um, everyone has said it, but it means pushing past voluntary action. We are going to deal with the entire life cycle. National action plans are fine and dandy, but that will not be what will deliver this. Um, and so, um, because we have to sort of have this level playing field and get everybody on board so that businesses don't feel that just because my community of countries is going this direction, I am ending up, my, the price for my product is higher than another community. And this, there is, there is a reality here because, um, you know, there is also um, uh, countries where you have mom and pop kind of soda companies and, and they will have, I mean, smaller companies. They are not the Unilevers of this world. They are not the Pepsi and the Coke. And for them, this is very difficult. And so having an understanding of those companies that might be smaller, but are providing an important, but how do they then move into this? So um, I think that's something that we clearly have to deal with. And then be mindful that um, I think uh, plastics jobs, <laughs> jobs in this sector are not, uh, we can't discard and say, oh, it's only in this and that country. It is a global phenomenon. Every country has this, but we all want to move away from the scourge of plastic in the environment. So how do we make that happen while being very mindful of these jobs and these development opportunities that these jobs bring? And how can we ensure that that transition <laughs> has a degree of justice within it? I think these are, in large part, some of the issues that we would like to highlight. Um, and then maybe just finally to say that industry can truly enable this. I mean, be the enabler, and I'd like to think that the industry that is present here is part of that enabling. Um, but um, the, the way that we will get there will be by understanding that there's a popular demand on dealing with the entire life cycle and on ensuring that we attack it, we tackle it from every perspective. Uh, and yes, some will have to focus more on the recycling bit, but the elimination bit is, is, is the thing that will actually take plastic out of the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Let's keep going with that thought of industry as an enabler to another voice from industry, Jim, if I may. So your company is a major producer of plastics. So what elements, and I'll give you two questions, what elements do you think, we'll answer, we got perspectives from others, what elements do you think will be most important for a treaty? And then as Inger noted, it's governments that are negotiating this treaty. How can we support governments in this process as they move ahead on the treaty journey? 
Right. Well, I, um, speaking for Dow and, and obviously the broader industry, we're heavily engaged in trying to make sure that we do reach a global treaty that can be legally binding. And to do that, we want as many countries as possible to be party to that. Um, that means a change in the way we do things that's transformational. Circularity is a big part of that. Uh, reuse of materials, uh, different forms, getting design standards up front on refillable, reusable types of packaging, more recycled content mandates, uh, so that can be done at a country level. Uh, we know from a voluntary basis, working with our partners in the brand industry, they have voluntary targets, many of them 30 to 50 percent post-consumer recycled content. And we are gearing up with investment to try to be able to meet that demand. But there needs to be more systematically to support that. There's been a lot of discussion around the elements of good enhanced producer responsibility schemes, which will bring in the funding that's necessary to move to a circular economy. That helps us to make sure that the waste doesn't end up back in the environment. And we know that at some point we're going to have to tackle pictures like the one you showed, and we're going to have to come up with a funding mechanism to be able to address that as well. You, you can't just clean up without changing the system, and you're going to need to do both to have a long-term sustainable solution. I think the other thing that's important, and Inger mentioned it, is the importance of science to this. Life cycle assessment is critically important. One of the reasons plastics has grown is because it provides a lot of value in protection of packaging. Could be food products, could be medical applications, it could be light weighting for automobiles and, and other devices that we use. In many of the industries, um, automotive industry even is working towards circular cars and how do we recycle the contents. And 40% of a typical vehicle today are polymers to make them lighter weight. So we know these things can be done, but we have to have some impetus to move in that direction. And I think we've got good alignment across the industry from a producer standpoint. And we have organizations that have been put together on a voluntary basis, which bring together the entire value chain, which is trying to tackle how do we move from a linear to a circular economy. Um, Inger's right, it's not just waste management, although we know from going into the developing world, many times when we're going into the developing world to tackle these challenges, we're confronted with a number of people who have no access to any waste management at all. I'm not talking about just plastics, I'm talking about any waste management. So somewhere along the way between industry and governments and using science, we're going to have to figure out ways to tackle how we have access to waste management for three billion people that don't have access to that today. And it, you know, that's, there's a cost to that and we have to navigate through this how we're gonna be able to tackle that. You've brought up many things that I'd love to circle, we will circle back to here in the panel. I, your suggestion that uh, these things can be possible with the right kind of um, stimulus for innovation from the treaties. What makes me, that really resonated, the thought that if we look at that treaty as a organism for, for putting to work the, I don't know how many thousand PhDs are sitting there, clever folk in Dow, if we create the right regulatory environment, they can innovate. I love that thought. Um, Minister gonzalez Che, if I may come to you again, we've talked a little bit about the um, multinational complexity of this issue. So we have, what, 193 states in the United Nations. Each of those countries with their own perspective, their own relationship to plastic production. We, of course, remember plastic is an oil and gas product, have their own relationship with oil and gas, own relationship, unique relationship with the back end from plastic pollution. So a whole sweat suite of different diverse perspectives there negotiating this treaty. Love your perspective on cooperation. So what role do we see, do you see cooperation playing in taking us further forward to the kind of treaty we're all imagining here together, an effective treaty for plastic pollution? 
Well, when it comes to cooperation in humankind history, well, this started from the outset. We walked and started gathering in small groups to cope with heat or cold. Many million years have passed, and cooperation is still as important as before for our survival. But it's not sufficient. Uh, having a good will is not sufficient, even if there is this legally binding treaty. And I would like to uh, make a remark. And it's nothing new. I'm just saying what has happened with other international treaties. For instance, in the ILO, there are 190-something international multilateral treaties. There's a periodic review. The main eight covenants, well, all the countries need to uh, report and in that review, and whenever there is a new covenant, there is a first review, and they need to respond to a very detailed survey. And we want to achieve even more with this treaty. What we're asking is to set up a sort of survey uh, every year, then every three years, and then for each country to explain what they did. For instance, what did Peru do to abide by the binding conditions in the treaty? A very straightforward question. Why did they manage to do so or why not? And if not, what was the reason? And then, the, for instance, the organization of the treaty would ask, how can we assist you or accompany you in order to fulfill those criteria, and not to punish them, but to support them in the process so that they can achieve what they set themselves to do. They may require technical expertise in certain specific areas, because governments will continue changing, politicians will change, the ministers will change, and ideologies will change in our governments. But when a state uh, adheres to a binding treaty, we should provide the necessary instruments so that this obligation become state policy. And that's why we need this periodic review with specific questions about what did they manage to achieve during the first year or after three years. And they could set up a, a timeline, let's say, uh, the Philippines in 2025, let's say, or 2024, they will sign the treaty. And the periodic review will be in 2026, for instance. And this way, each country will know when they need to uh, take part in this periodic review, which will take place every year, every two years, every four years. And this will respond to this logic. What did they manage to achieve? What did they didn't manage to achieve and why? And how can this organization that take, uh, in the treaty support them, not as a punishment, but rather to support them and to find out what they need in order to provide the necessary technical expertise. And only by doing so, these legally binding instruments can succeed. Many others uh, always have these double standards whereby countries abide or, or, or sign the treaty, but they, know they do not observe the conditions. And this periodic review should be made public. It should be published. And we're not talking about blacklisting or red listing. The idea is that a country, after signing, you know, after 10 years, I don't know, we could see 
what they have been doing. Uh, for instance, Burma, uh, 40 years ago, they would recruit children for the military services. And at the time, they uh, monitored what happened. And then Burma changed. And the system can be more powerful if, there are, if it is consistent and it has the necessary instruments to carry out this monitoring, an active monitoring because there'll be a point where a government will say, yes, you're right, plastics do pollute, plastics are harmful for health, for human health, and plastics go against human rights and the right to life, even to those that haven't been born yet, because if a woman is pregnant and she's becoming polluted, this is harming their unborn child. Thank you for that. Indeed, uh, there is something historic about this opportunity, very much historic and new, and yet thinking about recalling some of those models and those structures for cooperation, I think can give us confidence that we can move into this brave new, brave new space successfully. Um, Minister Benali, I'd actually like to put a question to you that Jim raised in a way. So Jim, you raised this question about investment. And there's a lot of parallels. I think we're already trying to draw lessons from other kinds of examples of multilateralism. But there's a lot of parallels that can be drawn between the plastic treaty process and climate change negotiations. One of those, of course, is thinking about how do we invest, as you asked, Jim, in uh, the global south, in developing countries, right? That is every much a question that's germane here in the treaty process. I'd love your, your take. How can we support developing countries as we move forward with this treaty? I think it's a very um, interesting question intellectually. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge that we have this year is to bring it from a nice intellectual question into a practical intellectual question. Because, um, I mean, it's true. I mean, we, we, there are a lot of parallelism that we can draw from climate negotiations. And uh, at UNDR 6, actually, we have uh, 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 thanks to uh, Inga Andersson and her team that raised the fact that we want to add more synergies between the different COPs and the different multilater multilateral environmental agreements because there are lessons that we can learn from each other. So we have an MEA day organized uh, by UNEP at, uh, at, uh, at UNEA 6 in, uh, in Kenya at the end of February. Uh, I think from our perspective, we tend to, yes, I mean, usually uh, th th there are a few challenges. I mean, the first one is that for countries of the global south, you usually have the same negotiators um, in, in, in climate negotiations as is in environmental negotiations and plastics negotiations as well. Usually we try to uh, carve out uh, a couple of uh, uh, public servants from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or, and the Ministry of Environment or Energy or, or whatever, whoever is the champion on, on the topic. Um, however, in front of us, and, and that's really a key issue that we have in terms of capacity building, uh, there are, uh, there is a limit to what we can achieve in terms of uh, uh, taking advantage of some of the uh, progress that we've made uh, on climate negotiations. For example, having, uh, I think there's a consensus today that we need a carbon price uh, or a valuation of carbon. But I strongly believe, and I think we had the discussion this morning um, uh, around that, is that on plastic, we've been a bit more advanced in terms of standards for um, for plastic recycling, uh, much more than uh, the, 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 the discussions that we've been having uh, on, on carbon pricing and, and climate. Um, and there are many reasons why that's the case. And I think the complexity, the over complexity of those questions, those two questions, uh, makes it difficult to try and take the best out of these two worlds. I think if we just keep it simple by saying, hey, today, full life cycle uh, of plastics emits 4% of greenhouse gas emissions. I know you don't like business as usual, but that would increase in a business as usual uh, to 19%, 20% of greenhouse gas emissions 
uh, in the next 20 years, if we just take that metric and use um, the impact, the bigger impact of, of, of the COP's climate um, to raise awareness on the things that I've shown, because one of the things that we, that we are facing in, in, in COP's uh, climate and COP biodiversity is that there is limited space for environmental questions. And uh, same thing, that's something that we have been discussing with Inga a lot. Um, we cannot bring climate discussions into, into the environmental discussion. So these are some of the aspects that we are trying to, um, I don't want to say break the silos, but increase the synergies between, uh, between the multilateral environmental uh, agreements in general and also uh, the different COPs so that, because at the end of the day, especially for, 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 uh, for countries of the Global South, we are the same negotiators that are in, the, in, in these different rooms. Um, you have the same public servants uh, from either the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or, or, or Energy or, or Environment that are in those rooms. So um, I think we need really to get beyond um, those silos, indeed. Well, if ever there was a domain where we needed to get rid of those silos, it would be in a space that's as complex as the plastic system, the plastic economy, the plastic industry. So 100% agree. 100% agree also with the idea of going from a theory of our conversations into practical matters, so uh, a lot of alignment. Um, I want to talk about recycling, and Jim, I want to ask you a recycling question. Hein, you mentioned recycling. Jim, you also mentioned recycling. Uh, and the analysis, the artificial intelligence work we've been doing, it's impossible for us to get to zero plastic waste in 2040 without recycling, but we need a lot more in right. that process with recycling. But one of the points you made before, but I'd love to give you a chance to dig down a little bit more on, relates to actually the supply of recycled feedstock. So what kinds of things do we need to do? We talked a little bit of investment. What do we need to do to make sure that that supply, if we make a big commitment for recycling feedstock, that it's there, that it materializes? Yeah, I think to um, collection, sorting, um, and, and creating a high value waste stream and not letting it get into the environment is critically important. If you want to have success in a circular economy, a waste stream like the picture you showed at the beginning, once plastics gets to that level, it's not recyclable, right? We, we need to clean it up and deal with the waste issue. What you want is you want your system to work so that instead of getting into the waste system, it's sorted out before and you've got a high quality stream that can be easily recycled to a specification, a scientific specification where we know it's clean and we know it can be used in an, a, another reuse again. So that's important. And I, you know, I want people to understand that the industry is working on both sides of this equation. I mean, we're working on how to make plastics with zero scope one and two emissions, right? We know we can do this through the energy transition with technologies like hydrogen and carbon capture, through other uses of power and steam that are, that are uh, friendly and green. On the other end, we also have to deal with the end of life and not let that get into the environment and bring it back and recycle it. We can do a lot from a design standpoint. Uh, so most, there are today uh, some plastic products that are hard to recycle because of the way the structures are put together. But there's a lot of work going on in companies today to simplify those structures and make them more homogenous so they're easy to recycle. The easier they are to recycle, the less challenges that we have in putting together that circular economy. I would say the other, uh, whether it's a developed country or a developing country, the, the challenges on collection and sortation are the same. In a developed country where you might have a well-managed landfill system, you still don't want to see that material get to landfill. You'd still rather see it collected at the home or at the industrial use. In many cases, in industrial uses, it's collected at a Walmart, uh, for example, or by an Amazon uh, from, from big bulk packaging that they use, and that's high quality waste that can be recycled. When you get into a developing country, and we know because as a coalition, we put together a group called the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, and we've done several public-private partnerships actually building full-scale MRFs, you have to deal with 
all the waste. You have to deal with the biomass, the construction waste, the glass, the metals, the plastics, and you have to come up with viable economic uses for each one of those. And when we're building that, we're typically, the good side is we're not starting with an existing infrastructure, we're starting with a clean sheet of paper so we can build it in that way from the beginning. When you're dealing with a developed economy, you've got an ecosystem that's there and operating and generating a profit. And now you want to try to divert so much plastic away from a landfill back into a circular economy. It's a different set of challenges. So I think the treaty has to be able to have some flexibility for the countries to do what fits their individual situation. I think one of the good things that's happened through the INC process is a tremendous amount of sharing of best practices of what works. And where industries, where we feel like we play the most important role is our ability to scale up technology. You, you want recycling to have a lesser footprint than making virgin material. So I don't, we don't want to recycle material and then create more environmental problems than we already have. We would actually like to recycle it and create less, use less energy, create less byproduct waste, and we think that's possible. And our job is to help governments understand how we can scale that up faster. I think even brand companies, we can help them understand how we can scale that up faster. And so real investment is needed. Um, we need internal targets on how much recycled content we want in our products. But I also think we need those external mandates that say we're going to drive to that level because the whole system change requires those kind of hard targets. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. I mean, I think that I think that image of the albatross, for example, we've all failed, right? It's a failure for the albatross, but as Inger said, it's a failure also because we have this material that we didn't want to get there not be recaptured and brought back in. So some good right. thoughts and points about a strategy to to make sure that does come back in and, and enabling conditions in the treaty that can make that actually truly possible. You know, we talked a, a, a variety of different ways about multilateralism, but I dare say no one knows more about multilateralism than you and certainly UNEP in general. They've brought all kinds of sticky, challenging, multilateral international agreements across the finish line. What do we have to learn from some of that, those past successes that we should draw into this process? So, I mean, since 72, when we were founded, the way that the world has looked upon environmental challenges is to find a way to come that are global in nature, is to sort of mimic what the EPAs do at the national level, right? So what is it that, what's the problem? How do we get together around it and how can we solve it? And, um, and UNEP has been the conveyor belt for practically all the, the treaties, conventions that you know of and to whose cops you go. Some became so big that they no longer sit with us, but that's a, a different story. And so um, this treaty is it's not the first time, <laughs> nor will it probably be the last. Um, but what's very clear is that, uh, it, as everyone has said, it shall have legally binding elements and it shall deal with the entire life cycle. And so that's, these are the parameters within which negotiators are operating. And, and when, once you have legally binding, then it becomes, so what does that look like, right? Um, and in other treaties, and uh, let me mention a couple, Montreal Protocol, the one that deals with the, with the hole in the ozone layer, uh, clearly, there was a phase out schedule of the ozone depleting substances um, the chlorinated gases, and um, and yeah, there were some. You know, we're not, we can't do it as fast as we asked for an exception for. Uh, but on the whole, this process has sort of marched forward. Um, uh, I could mention similarly the Minamata Convention for those of you who are familiar with it. It's a convention that deals with exit of mercury. So therefore, today you want to buy a thermometer, it will not have mercury you want to, light bulbs will not have, even your dental amalgam will not have mercury. A, a UNEP treaty, not so well known, but there you have it. 
uh, or you are in the um, pets trade and you want to sell certain fish for the aquarium, well, you know, it is regulated by us. There are 10,000 species that are listed. Some you can trade and some you can't. And so that gives you a sort of up, down, no, you can't. Maybe you can, but then you have to apply for a license. We'll give you a license, and then you can move that particular thing across uh, if member states have so agreed. And all of this is based on science, right? It's not sort of, oh, I think that this fish is pretty, so therefore, no. <laughs> There is an understanding that um, the science needs to tell us what's happening. And so this treaty instrument, agreement, whatever it's going to have to be called, will have to have some clear targets because there are some legally binding elements and it'll have to have some scientific dimensions to it. It will also have to have some financing attached to it and I think everyone understood. But let's recall, please, that we don't get blinded by dollar signs in our eyes. Let's recall, please, that um, private sector, once a regulatory setting sets in, they adjust and they will rarely need a subsidy from the government to make some of those shifts. Um, some places would, but other places would not. Um, and so when we think about Montreal Protocol, what we had was um, a fund that over 30 years has dispersed some 4 billion. So, but 30 years, 4 billion, to help on refrigerants, coolants, um, and of course, foams, fire foams, and uh, other things that have uh, chlorinated gases and, 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 and uh, ozone depleting gases. It'll have to have, and this is what foreign minister was talking about, some degree of effectiveness review, um, that we will look at a compliance mechanism and if you read Montreal Protocol, the first chapter is compliance. You know, boom, that's it. How are we going to comply with this thing? And so um, we can say that the three Rio treaties are much softer. There are these frameworks where we agree to have national plans and we add it all up and then we check are we doing and how are we doing. I don't think the world has patience for this. And anyhow, UNEA gave very clear guardrails for there will obviously be national action plans, don't get me wrong, but that is not on its own enough. And so the targets, etc., will be clear and the effectiveness reviews will be clear. So I think, I mean, obviously in stakeholder engagement, the last point, you have to have throughout the process, and here may be a really good example, is a biodiversity convention, which has a very open uh, engagement um, much biodiversity is in indigenous, in indigenous people's lands, therefore indigenous people are very present in that convention. I think here we are seeing, yes, companies, a yes, science, um, but also others that are in the waste sector, be they waste pickers or be they others who are clearly impacted by or affected by uh, these issues. So these are some of the issues that I would expect. and. Uh, and, and very much what we're already seeing now in the INC process. Thank you for that, Inger. Um, hi, and I want to come to a last, at least a last, final question for our panelists. I want some sum-up thoughts from you all. Um, but Inger mentioned adaptation, the ways that some of these businesses, and particularly I think the context with small businesses, can be made to adjust to provisions that come forward for the treaty. So let me say, when we pass, we'll just go there, when we pass a, a robust, meaningful treaty, um, what kinds of things, maybe I'll have you take on the perspective of big business, what kinds of things could big, will big businesses need to do to adjust, to comply with the treaties, perhaps particularly in respect to supply chains or any kind of adjustments that you might forecast? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, expected us to be uh, flexible and agile and respond, and, and in fact, I think that's right, but because on that one, I'm, Look, I don't want to be naive, um, but I'm very optimistic on that. And let me just give you three quick reasons why that is. First of all, we're a branded uh, consumer company, so you know I'll talk through that lens. We do a lot of surveys. We do a, you know consumer surveys, and we ask consumers for their pain points and what they, you know, what bothers them. Let's not forget, uh, whilst probably they're not always prepared to pay for it, but plastics and the way it's packaged and how their favorite brands come across. And when they look at all of that, it is a very big pain point. So it forces consumer uh, companies, and I guess any company, to come up with solutions that are innovative, that answer that issue and that pain point. And therefore that can contribute to the brand value. 
Uh, you refer to, um, you know, to the evolution of laundry products. It's absolutely true if you think about it. Um, you know, we started with a bar, a, a soap bar to wash it. Then we moved to powder solutions, a little bit of packaging in there, actually on the bar, very little. Then, oh, liquids is a great idea, brought plastics to it. Uh, after liquid, well, the good news was we were able to downsize it again into concentrates and capsules. Okay, that helps a little bit. Now, um, the latest that we're, we're adding, just to answer all of these challenges, is a small paper sheet that is, you know, degradable in a biodegradable and paper packaging uh, part. So, <laughs> you know, it's sort of the, it's all the way around, um, which is in a way a bit sad, but I believe businesses will respond through innovation. So that's number one, very important. Um, I think number two, we will not make the plastics, or we will not make our greenhouse gas emission targets that businesses also have issued for themselves and will be held accountable to if we don't solve the plastics problem. So yes, there will be additional cost in the supply chain probably, but uh, we need it to, uh, to, to achieve other goals. At Unilever, we, we, we looked at it. If we don't make our plastic targets, it would mean a 10% problem on our greenhouse gas emission targets. So that's number two. Then number three is the opportunity cost. There's a significant opportunity cost. You know, we are collecting, we're, one of our goals is to collect more plastic uh, than what we make. And, you know, for example, in India, we're now at sort of that 100% level, which is great news. <laughs> but then you don't tackle the root cause. You know, you're effectively adding cost to the system. And you, it's much better to spend that money up front and having the right design, I think what you already talked about. Uh, so, look... Not naive, but I believe there's a lot of opportunity uh, to adjust quickly to, uh, to a treaty. Um, then, let me go back to the treaty in itself. I think businesses always do better when it's a stable uh, and, a, and a clear and an overseeable regulatory framework. And I think, therefore, a treaty with binding elements to it and compliance to it, I think, will bring that stability. And I think that's something that businesses generally like. Uh, so we will adapt our supply chains to that. Um, I think it's also important, you talked about targets, and the minister talked about targets. You know, um, I think this is something for us to reflect on. A hard target, a very hard and an ambitious target, will also unlock something that is the hardest thing for businesses to do, and that is change consumer behavior. You know, when you think of refill, for example, and refill of, of products, it's interesting, when I go to, and I was in India actually last week, so I saw it, once again, refilling, um, washing uh, powder or, or, or liquid, you know, with a, a, you know, a bottle that you have at home and then with another product is, from an affordability standpoint, it's used widely there. It, it's done all the time. It's much harder to, to bring that solution to retailers in Europe and to consumers in Europe or probably in the United States because they're not driven by an affordability question it's driven by a convenience question. A hard target, I think, will unlock consumer uh, behavior change, and that will also uh, take money out of the system. Long story short, yes, it will add some complexity and some costs, but there are so many offsetting factors that I think businesses will simply respond, so I agree with Inge. Thank you, Heine. All right, I'm going to absorb your optimism. I want you all to absorb the same optimism. Bring your own optimism to a one-sentence answer, because we're just about out of time. <laughs> One sentence answer, what's the most important thing to get right in this treaty? Mr. Benali. Well, uh, well, apparently, well, in addition to the compliance, the target, the timelines, etc., I was thinking whether we can have something similar to a, not a loss and damage fund, but some, some sort of funding of especially the cleaning. But we understand that we cannot, there's no point in cleaning if we continue polluting, right? So. Some, something similar to a loss and damage fund, although it took us 30 years to reach that in, uh, in the COP negotiations. So uh, we, I don't think we can wait 30 more years. I'll count that as a sentence. Thank you, <laughs> Minister Jim. I think, I think you have to keep science in the front. I mean, anytime you're moving one material to another, material substitution, there are scientific impacts. You've got to look at that. We also have to look at scientific uh, data on the health impacts. Uh, and so we need to keep science front and center and have the right peer reviews of that science to make sure that we're actually making a positive improvement in the environment. Music to my heart, Jim, as a scientist. Hein. Well said before, but I would say a uh, full life cycle has to be in the treaty and it has to be top down and bottom up. Both. Well done, Inger. I'll pick up on the full life cycle. 
but then add to that with innovation, with boldness, and with ambition. Perfect. Minister, the final thought. Perhaps a one sentence thought. Most ambitious thing we should do the treaty. Minister Gonzalez Alachea. This should lead us to understand and to realize that all this transition and climate crisis requires ethics in capital letters and that it requires philosophers of life and humankind that think about uh, the current and future generations. Experts and technicians uh, come to a limit. Uh, politicians change. But we don't have cyber ethics or cyber philosophers who think about a better future and uh, a possible I ask, future. I also ask you, I want to bring up to the, to the screen very quickly the results of the same question that we looked at. Let's see if I can peer over in that direction. So. Uh, a lot of support, dominant support for phasing out unnecessary single-use plastics. But I, I would say it looks like with the exception of our last choice, creating a global fund, although I'd have to say I'm in complete agreement with our panel for this being essential, that there's a lot of a diversity of opinions and votes that are up there, which to me sounds like our collective intelligence suggests we need a lot of things. Uh, there's no silver bullet to this in the treaty. Well, we'll have the opportunity not to do this in the abstract, but do this in real life in the next two months. My final thought for you all <clears throat> is that it's interesting you should mention the Montreal Protocol because last night, to sort of show my cards, for my level of engagement in Davos nightlife, I was watching a panel <laughs> from 1986 <clears throat> on the Montreal Protocol. Mm. But this is before the treaty itself, the protocol was passed. Mm folks talking about the ozone layer, and there were some similarities and some differences. Uh, happily, some differences. There was all men on this panel. There were some bad ties on this panel. Um, <laughs> but some similarities. They were talking about the gravity of a almost uh, existential, a truly grave problem in the form of ozone to the planet. But they also talked about uh, transitions for industry, transitions for the impacts on economy, some of the things that we spoke about here. But my happy thought, my encouraging thought, and the one that I'll leave you with, is that one year after that panel aired, a treaty came to fruition that ended that problem. We've talked about plastic, it seems like, forever here in Davos. What if this was the last conversation we ever had to have about plastic pollution? Because in one year, we ended. Take that thought with you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you all for joining us.